Uh, let's talk about Leviticus 25. I think this is probably the most prominent thing uh, that I see that comes up on this whole question. So I'll just read right. verses 40 through 44 through 46, which says, As for your male and female slaves whom you may have, you may buy male and female slaves from among the nations that are around you. You may also buy among the strangers who sojourn with you and their clans that, that are with you who may have been born in your land and they may be your property. You may bequeath them to your sons as you inherit as a possession forever. You may make slaves of them, but you should not, but over your brothers, the people of Israel, you should not rule over one another ruthlessly. So I think there's a couple of things that are brought up. I think most importantly is this idea that it seems like we have this like idea of like permanent slavery um, of non-Israelites and Israelite culture. So what's kind of like your thoughts as you go through this passage? Right. Well, keep in mind a few things here. Uh, the language of transaction, of acquiring, uh, bequeathing. Uh, keep in mind that the language of acquiring is the same language that is used of God who acquired the Israelites when he brought them out of Egypt. He purchased them. He redeemed them. It's Think of the language of our sports teams where you have an owner of a team. You have, uh, you have those who are traded uh, players. You have those who are um, you know, bought and sold uh, by various teams. We don't think, oh, that person is mere property. Uh, no, it's simply the language of a legal uh, transaction here. Some people say, yeah, the Israelites, we, I get that they were not uh, property, that this was an indentured servitude, that they worked for seven years, that six years they paid off their debt, and then they were free to go about uh, their lives as you know, ordinary citizens without any uh, remaining uh, debt uh, and you know, no change in their status. It was just that they were under contract. Well. In, for the foreigner who might come into Israel maybe after war or in, uh, in difficult circumstances like Abraham going to Egypt in time of famine, etc., uh, there were various, you know, various circumstances in which uh, in, a foreigner might end up in the land of Israel. Well, we understand that in Leviticus 25, this is related to the year of Jubilee that in which the land that has been leased goes back to the original owner after 50 years. So uh, so even if you have uh, had some financial hardships, the land would revert back to the owner. And the land was a gift from God to the nation of Israel that was di divided up into tribes, and tribal territories. And where was the foreigner to go? The foreigner couldn't own land. The foreigner would have to typically attach himself to a, an Israelite family. And of course, living within an Israelite home, I mean, John Golden Gay uh, writes that, uh, that the who's Old Testament scholar says that to be a servant in someone's home was basically to be a part of the family. You, uh, and if you, lived within that sort of a setting, uh, your, your food and uh, clothing, uh, your shelter and uh, your, your, your employment uh, was taken care of. So there was no way in which you could own land as, a, as an alien or a sojourner. That was the prerogative and the privilege of uh, being an Israelite. So that was just the condition uh, in which, uh, under which the Israelites operated. And so, uh, so yes, it wasn't as though a, it was a, it's a kind of a Western uh, idea of, yeah, maybe even a foreigner could own land here, say in the United States. It was a, it was a different way of, uh, of thinking. Mm -hmm. And again, there's a theological basis for that. But let me also add this. Uh, so, so you, you know, you've got the foreigner who comes or the alien who lives in the land, attaches himself to a family. Well, again, he's still not, you know, the next generation is going to be able to own land either. So uh, that is going to be then they're going to remain within that family. So the language of being bequeathed to the next generation uh, is, is something that, you know, there is a certain sense of security and stability that comes with that. Uh, are these ideal circumstances? No. Uh, but again, it's a way of uh, showing care for the alien. Remember, just in Leviticus 19, just a few chapters earlier, there's a command to 
look out for and to love the alien in your midst. Mm. So, uh, so here, and, and again, over 30 times you have this mention in the old, in the old Testament law that, you know, remember that you were once aliens, same word in the land of Egypt. And so therefore you're to look out for them. And so here, then you come across this verse and some people act as though, oh, that overturns all of those uh, you know, verses that are repeating. You were once slaves in the land of Egypt. You were once aliens in the land of Egypt. Therefore, look out for those who are disadvantaged. You see over and over again a concern, a humanitarian concern for those who could be most taken advantage of, the orphan, the widow, uh, the, you know, the alien living in the land. So repeatedly you see that triad mentioned and not to take advantage of those who could be most uh, easily exploited. But let me just continue on here with this passage because a lot of people stop at verse 46 and the text goes on in verse 47 of Leviticus uh, 25 to say that if the means of a stranger or a sojourner become sufficient, in other words, those people who are living as strangers in the land, foreigners in the land, they could actually become persons who acquire sufficient wealth such that they could, and get this, they could potentially acquire an Israelite. Now, is an Israelite a, an object, just a piece of property and so forth? No, of course not. But that same transactional language is used of the Israelite in this text. For example, you know, and the goal is obviously if you have a, 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 a relative who could be your kinsman, a redeemer, who could buy you out of that debt, you wouldn't have to live under the, uh, under the auspices of this foreigner, uh, that that would be optimal. And so it says, you know, goes on in verse 50 to say that the, uh, it says that he then, this Israelite, um, with his um, with his purchaser shall calculate from him or the, the foreigner will calculate uh, whoever's being redeemed um, you know, will calculate the amount uh, and so forth and so uh, so this person this Israelite the same term that's used of acquiring the foreigner uh, the alien is now being used of the Israelite. And so if you're talking about this being a mere object uh, or an objectification of the foreigner, well, no, you actually have it here of the Israelite. But again, it's a transactional language. And again, that same verb, kana, is used uh, to acquire, is used of the Israelites as God redeemed them and brought them out of the land of Egypt in, uh, in uh, Exodus 15, 16. So, so again, I think that the we can you mentioned some of these things to kind of offset that language of, oh, that's mere property and say, no, there's actually a little bit more going on here than we may realize. Optimal circumstances, no. But again, there is a, a very strong emphasis on humanitarian, con mm. humanitarian concern, concern for the for and love for the foreigner or the alien in your midst. And that language of acquisition, uh, that seeming property language is also used to the Israelite. And clearly we're not talking about the Israelites being mere property or something like that. So, so those are a few things that I think are helpful in offsetting some of the uh, challenges that uh, critics will raise about a text like this. Mm.